Okay, so this is the one that I'm going to talk about first. I've got a trace here, and then at the time I'm going to talk about another interesting um, poster that came to my attention. Um, so basically, um, this was um, an oral that was presented at the ADA. I'll be very proud of the action. This is the oral presentation, but did have the opportunity to read it in the journal article. And what this was, and I guess the question is why did it make it to the Journal of Medicine, was a presentation of fully clothed with insulin pump therapy. So what's fully clothed with insulin pump therapy? Fully clothed with insulin pump no announcements by the user, no intervention by the user, um, in a non-critical care situ um, situation setting, um, in a randomized controlled two center study that occurred in Europe. This um, was a, um, the work of the group in Cambridge, Roman Borko, who's one of the lead um, engineers in closed loop um, system delivery, as well as his medical team. And what occurred for this study was it was an open label randomized trial in two general wards in the UK and Switzerland. Um, patients were enrolled by type 2 diabetes um, with various degrees of health, and the, uh, the average age of 10, I think, was about 8. And 70 subjects were randomized to closed loop versus 66 on the standard of care. So what were the closed loop items that were utilized? It was a freestyle navigator too, which is not available in the United States, as well as a surreal and personal problem, which is also not available in the United States. But we're going to have it will be coming up really soon. Um, subjects also um, enrolled were put on a blind CGM for data analysis subsequently. So subjects who were in the control arm on their standard of care, whatever they were using, in Europe it appears they were off um, Subfamiliar readings with insulin on the patient study, surprisingly enough. And um, the results were actually fairly striking in terms of the differential in time and range. Um, time and range included um, here was listed, and that was the target was between 100 and 180. Close loop control group achieved a target of 65.8% time and range, um, and with some variability on that, as I listed here versus 41.5% um, plus by the 16% um, in the control arm. There was no hyperglycemia in either arm, and um, that was basically the um, results of the study. And the conclusions of the author were is that closed loop insulin um, delivery on the inpatient setting had the potential to improve loop of control. Um, and um, further studies that really needed to expand this and have to further impact the decision making in terms of the actual aid benefit of this. And to um, utility of this in a larger situation, which, which raises a whole series of questions, I think, in terms of the cost, um, feasibility from a nursing perspective. There was an just of the type of um, the, um, the, the other questions I think that really come up are is the level of suboptimal glucose control that you see in the control arm, only 40% of the range. And I think that that may be. Close to, I hope we do better in that sign, but I'm not sure we actually do. And it was striking last year when they presented an oral on this um, at sort of the level of glucose control and uh, how little actually um, people are able to achieve on the inpatient setting with several Yeah. Thank you. 
here is that information sets can be provided by the wire, wireless uh, technology. The one thing that I want to caution about is UK and Switzerland, the level of acuity of the patients that are hospitalized there on average is very different than places that you would find in Mount Sinai, where you have to be to get to the ICU, or you have to be near there to be hospitalized and you have to be out after two days. So the duration of stay is much longer. The acuity So I think that we need to uh, see something similar on similar size in the U.S. and in the U.K. also before we can start being really excited. Yes, so um, funny, okay, okay. Well, I think we really have to pause and think where we are going to come out here. So application of closer technology is great, but ultimately at what cost? You know, for an insane amount of cost for sensors and pumps for patients who typically aren't using them for standard care as an option. And what we actually learned from using this patient side, one of the biggest challenges we have when we're seeing someone on the patient side is what do they do when they go home? And we're trying to figure out that. And we're trying to extract what we see in the inpatient side. Granted, there's a lot of changes. The UNC is different on the inpatient and outpatient side. But we know from our closing studies, you actually get very little from knowing the insulin requirements in the closing system to what they, that actually translates to even on the patient side. And so now we're just learning uh, algorithm control. We get very little data from this public discharge. And then when they go home, what's the expectation? Yeah. They're probably not going to go home on you know, close the control. In an ideal world, like in the future, when everything is cheaper, maybe. But I don't know if this is really saving us. Yes. And, and, and we good. also don't really know the true benefit from an outcome perspective. Yes, it's like the time. Cardiovascular risk should 
be assessed in every person with diabetes and people with CVD or high risk should essentially, in this um, understanding, are almost required to be treated with SGLT2 or GLP1. Um, a very interesting, totally different approach to, um, to the issues of adherence and management, and, and a, a, a nice diagram of how to manage people recognizing that, you know, 20% of prescriptions are never filled, 50% adherence is the average, and so on. Um, so I think when this, I actually emailed John Buse yesterday to try to get the slides not that I wanted to present all, you know, three hours worth. But uh, he said, well, the website isn't quite up yet, but it will be. Um, and um, I think you need to distinguish the best of the season. Well, they do, of course. They, 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 they do. Were you there? Uh, so it's it's I yes they distinguish the two. Uh, they made the point that GLP ones might be better for cardiovascular disease without heart failure. They didn't really, I think, pay enough attention to pioglitazone, which I think really should be strongly considered for people with cardiovascular disease who don't have um, heart failure. And there's actually a very interesting. Um, a publication already, in, I think it's circulation, on iris, uh, symptomatic heart failure in iris, showing that it was not greater in the pyoglitazone group than the control group, so that it, it's certainly possible to take people at high cardiovascular risk and use pyoglitazone. But, um, you know, this is, and then Silvio and Zuki got up and said, how about using real risk as a important consideration. And it's a whole potential pathway of now not focusing just on A1C, at least for those individuals who have significant CKD, those people who have significant uh, heart failure or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease going in a completely different direction. But they actually gave, they, they did include Xenotide once weekly as part of the GLP ones. Um, most of the emphasis was on, and, and the SGLT2s, it's really murky because of the amputation question. So most of the discussion was on AMPA, but we're going to learn about DAPA next year and, and so on. Um, so I think. You know, again, that, that, that certainly could be the whole hour, and maybe at some point it should be, but once we get all that material, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of other great stuff. Uh, they did cost-benefit analysis. They, 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 they did so a cost-benefit analysis, and they said if the bottom line is the bottom line, whoever mentioned that, uh, then... Right. If, if the bottom, right. So if you look at it that way, then you use metformin, sulfonylureas, pyoglitazone, and NPH, period. Uh, and that's kind of interesting, but um, that's it. But, you know, we should, obviously, we should make the, the drugs that have that that are available. Yeah, and then we'll 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 sort of go through whoever has something to contribute and then I can talk more about something else. Um this is just not a place to just ask. Take a go on that one. Um so this was one poster that sort of caught my eye and somewhat related to Zach's. Uh you know, we live in this world now of data, data that's being sold, data that's being stolen, and data that's just available for mining. Um, and I think that was one thing that struck me is that this meeting there was much more uh, 
execution of real world data and trying to use machine learning algorithms to kind of predict uh, order responders who are going to be uh, to, to in sort of in this era of precision or personalized medicine. So this was a study, uh, a retrospective observational that looked at um, who was going, uh, which providers were going to prescribe GLP ones, uh, and uh, what what patient characteristics were more likely. Um, and so ultimately, they found that it was younger patients, ages less than seventy, that had been on basal insulin, on world um, anti-diabetic agents. Uh, and then private insurance, and they just showed the data in a different way. And this is a prescriber's uh, pattern, basically. And they were only able to pick up prescribe prescriptions, not necessarily people who actually picked up the medications. Anyways, so here uh, this, you see that these were the driving factors for when providers decided to add a GLP-1 percent practice. So these were people who had been on a longer basal insulin, prescribed co medications, and the average of medications were like 10 to 11 other medications. Actually, a really large amount of medication for a patient. Private insurance, which I think is, is intuitive, uh, oral diabetic agents, uh, and a higher BMI here. Then they looked at actually uh, for the patients, and this was 80,000 patients looking at um, basically people who were prescribed, it was about 17,000 patients who were prescribed GLP ones, 62,000 were not. Then they looked at of those patients that were prescribed GLP ones. Who could they predict what patient characteristics? And they looked at, I think, uh, 122 variables. Um, who is going to respond with the agency drop rate of 1%? So you can see that the numbers actually went, in, that they included in their analysis went down significantly, even from 17,000. And these were people that they had pre and post A1C values. And the only factor that, uh, that seemed to predict whether they responded to, an a, to, a, uh, to a GLP-1 was based on A1C, nothing else, not BMI, not medications, not age, uh, not insurance, and that was the only thing that they proved. So it's, I, I just found it interesting that in this era where we're trying to use all this personalized medicine and trying to figure out, you know, who's going to be the best person to go to jail can we use this in our clinical decision all the time? And say, well, so these patients really benefit from it. And this is not factoring in things like that mentioned, you know, CHF, or any vascular disease, and so forth, but this sort of real world Looking at um, who can respond. So the only, at the end of the day, it seems like it was just uh, a one And granted, there's all the limitations of being an observational retrospective study using only you know prescription uh, uh, sense, not prescription fill data. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting that we you know we throw all these things for patients and make all this analysis at the end of the day, and only find that a one is the uh, uh, the sort of a <clears throat> so this is also true with LDL, higher the LDL for greater than yeah. blood pressure. And um, it's, it's, so the, the correct way to do this study would have been to look at the A1C, the assigned A1C, adjust the A1C delta to see what the predictive part of that. And then we might have come up with some other. Um, it's a pediatric component and 
that was what was reported out at the meeting. And then there are two adult components. Um, and the whole purpose of this study is early intervention to preserve pancreatic beta cell function. So either impaired glucose tolerance or uh, newly diagnosed uh, type 2 diabetes. So the adult studies are uh, one, there's a bariatric surgery one, and then there's one um, uh, that's um, got some additional agents to this study. I think it has um, glutide and I think bio is also one of the arms. So th those are ongoing, but this study, which is really a remarkable study, uh, they had uh, enrolled 90 children ages 10 through 19, uh, about two thirds of them had impaired glucose tolerance and, and one third had type 2 diabetes. They couldn't uh, be previously treated. Um, I think some of them were on metformin, so this is distinct in the children's study and the adult study. They couldn't be uh, previously treated. And they were open label, uh, randomized, either that three months of insulin followed uh, by nine months of metformin or metformin for the whole study. So it was about uh, 45 per group. The um, study intervention, the testing, was a hyperglycemic plan. So that is where you acutely raise glucose to about 200 and then keep the glucose at 200 and then at the end of the plan, um, they gave artery to further stimulate uh, insulin secretion. So what you see on these plants is when you do the acute bolus of glucose to bring the glucose up to 200, you see first phase insulin. Then you do steady state, and then when you do the artery at the end, you sort of see what's left over in uh, beta cell. They did this at month zero, month 12, and then a huge question from the DPP is, are you really treating, just treating diabetes because you have to be on metformin, or is there a legacy effect? What happens when you stop? So they did uh, three months after stopping, and in fact, the primary outcome was the three months off of um, medication. And the hypothesis is that if you preserve beta cell, if you improve beta cell function, you would see an improvement in insulin secretion and uh, that this would have uh, a longer duration. The remarkable thing about the study is that they had 90% or so retention of these kids. I mean, that they did this study is beyond belief. Uh, however, there were absolutely no changes, no improvements in beta cell function. So essentially, beta cell function continued to deteriorate through the study, independent of treatment, uh, and uh, whether you gave metformin alone or first the insulin, where the hypothesis was you increase glucose toxicity. So they were trying to get them down to uh, blood glucose is in the normal range, which only that half of them did. Um, and then gave metformin, neither uh, of those arms um, um, was beneficial. They have the baseline data from the adults, and they compared it to the kids. And what they did show is that kids are much more, type 2 diabetic kids, are much more insulin resistant than adults. Now, me, it just, what their index of insulin resistance is, um, glucose disposal during the plan, which even though it's 200, you can, you can get a measure of glucose being infused instead of say your insulin sensitivity, and then you just do a ratio to the circulating insulin, and the insulin in kids is much, much higher, they have much better beta cell secretory capacity, but they are very insulin-resistant. So, um, and it looks like they can compensate their glucose tolerance more quickly than adults. So maybe pediatric type 2 is a bit of a different disease, a more aggressive disease, they suggested. They'll have the formal comparisons with all the same testing from the adult cohort, and that will be able to be presented next year.
next year, uh, I think this is kind of disappointing for those of us who thought that perhaps if we could intervene early, um, we could prevent diabetes. Uh, and it will be very interesting to see whether the adult data show prevention or whether all that we're seeing in the DPP is being on that format. Uh, it is now a well established fact that adolescents who are recently do develop a behavior with those hormones go on to develop diabetes much more quickly than the adults who are And to me, I feel that it makes good sense to me because there has to be something greater in terms of it's not the risk situation. There has to be something else in their genetic makeup that predisposes the first place as adolescents to create a reason to have. Uh, and as I said, the trajectory to diabetes is much, much quicker than that. And this is already shown actually in the case of treatment options for type 2 diabetes in a decade in adolescents who have the same thing. They show the same thing, and others show the same thing. So I'm not totally surprised at these results because of the geometry. There's something genetically different about adolescents who already have some chemical glucose tolerance with that, with whatever degree of reason. And it is related to the degree of obesity. So, uh, stage two and three of obesity, uh, greater than 90% of the normal, greater than 140% of the normal, as we see, will develop it even further than, than others. But there must be something intrinsically different about these species that leads them to get diabetes and the problem is still not present. That is surprising because the young people had a different form of a much greater. I do think there's something about the kids that 
getting younger, there's some other type of genetic makeup like oh, this. Yeah. This is a group that I would do as a medic screen on because that's something that predisposes these particular people to get diabetes too. As I said, it's pretty much documented this now. This trajectory from the kid who goes to this diabetes is much quicker than it goes in the past. And that would explain why we can see the same thing. And it's also one Gestational diabetes, and I don't know the latest on, but I know that that's also, you know, there are several different cohorts that I think would be very interesting to get to. So we'll get to them there. Well, I think the best day intervention is the tripod study, because they actually showed the duration that was the equivalent of the A session on continuous glucose monitoring, and uh, so this was a uh, comparison. It was a three-way study of um, Eversen the Eversense CGM and uh, Dexcom and uh, the Abbott. And I talk was talking to Carol about this, uh, like I think at a cocktail party the, that night of the study. Uh, so there was this. Um, a fellow from Mass General who's uh, working with Steve Russell and who conducted this study it was, uh, her name is Dr. Jaffrey, and it was a three way head to head study of uh, CGM in 23 type 1 patients um, over uh, 20 uh, four week period. Um, the, over, the ever since the other sense is a new device. It's, a done, it's inserted in the arm. It was just FDA approved uh, last week. Um, and the ever sense, and then the Freestyle <clears throat> Abbott, and then the Dexcom G5. But she, I th someone asked her about G6. I think she also uh, used the G6 in these, uh, in these 23 patients as well. Um, so it was a three-way comparison. The Eversense system performed the best in the hyperglycemic range, while the Dexcom performed best in the hypoglycemic range. And the Eversense has an accuracy that's at least as good as Z5. Um, so basically, the point of this is we have another tool that we can use uh, in the um, type 1 patients, and, and instead of the G5 for like when we're using this for the bionic pancreas. But it's also a take home message because the um, the Eversense is going to be available out there in the real world, and uh, they started doing demos in the exhibit hall, uh, you know, sign up and uh, learn how you can do this insertion. I have a feeling that, I mean, it's like really a very neat technique that it lasts for three months and then it has to be removed and the next one put in. I have a feeling there's going to be, uh, there's going to be it problems with it because um, you, you, use, you don't use uh, sutures, you use starry strips. And I have a feeling that there's going to be like um, some botched up jobs. Well, stay tuned. <laughs> but anyway, it's like a really great potential um, alternative to using the G5. And it can have it in for three months. There's a lot of problems with the Dexcom and the Abbott like falling off. Um, you know, in the, and it's, so it's just another um, tool that's out there that's very, very accurate. So, you know, these are, these are one of the sites for that study, and we have our resident, one of about eight people in the United States who actually inserted these, and that's David. Um, and if you want to give me additional feedback, so that the actual process um, of the insertion and removal, you know, none of, no other technologist trains, not many are trained surgeons, but it's actually a relatively simple procedure. Um, we use surgery in our trial as well. And the scarring, um, in the location, it's not a very high torsion area. And 
and so there's not the same thing as far as you basically see on the line, it's that same line. Uh, obviously, it's the first event, it's not for removal. I think that the more challenging part is removal. Um, there's a learning curve in terms of how you can set yourself up for success when the insertions make removal easier. Uh, take it from someone who's still looking for about two hours trying to find the thing. Um, so, uh, there's lessons to learn there. There, I think, there's sometimes a whole person trying to gain something to know. How big is the insertion? Uh, the insertion is about a centimeter long, um, and you go about, uh, I'd say, about three, quarter, three quarters of a centimeter deep. Um, and the size of the it, it's small. Yeah. Well, we did the instruction to wing, it's a little bit expensive, but when we can muscleize them, Very easy to use. It doesn't need to start. It's much easier to eat than the scary surface. It's always much better. What did you want to do? Um, hard to get out. Hard to get out. It's a little bit of fun. It's a much smaller area. You can make a small fish. It's pretty good. I'm digging around for hours to locate it. And I mean, what I'll say is, it's not very big. But by another story, he was pulling it out in, in less than a minute. But the first two, it, it, there's a learning curve, so um, it's really challenging. And also, all of us we learn the true skill of technique. You know, how to do this, and, and you know, learning how to be teacher and all, the, all, all those features of it. Um, it's very superficial. Um, it's it's yeah, actually true. Kind of it's more superficial uh, from a use standpoint. Um, I think also the, um, the, com the company was saying recommending. We can do it at the same time. But I don't know about that. I think it has to take a little bit more minutes if you want to do it. It, it, it does. It, it definitely does. And it's not trained surgeons. So it's going to be clearly a learning curve. Your presentation is going to be a very easy one. Um, I think, in, in my mind, with the G6 now out, which doesn't require, this requires calibration still twice a day. The, the other um, thing to consider is I think that the cohort that may be the most beneficial on this. Are really going to be people with adhesive issues because we change the, the adhesive every day. So, anyone who's going to adhesive challenges, this is going to be very beneficial for them because they change it every single day. People want like to take it off, but not. It's much smaller than what we did in our study. In our, in our study, we wanted our subject to be wearing a leg a lot more. Now it's much smaller, it's sleeper, and I think that was an advance. But I think 180 day wear, which is I believe now in Europe, is going to be quite much more beneficial. So since this is no longer a very interesting thing to think about it, um, two things. There, there are different CPT codes for the insertion and the creation of the pouch. So as we are thinking of implementing this in practice, yes. we have to make sure that it's available on Epic. Uh, that three codes for insertion, creation of the pouch, and removal are all there. But this is going to be an issue, you know, just like CGM. Uh, you know, if you do a blind at CGM, that's like seeing one and a half million patients. It's a massive part of the use of that. Um, the same way, this could be good or this could be a huge distraction. So we need to figure that part out. And they haven't been able to get out either. Yeah. And then separate from that, I mean, this study is about three of us. It's not just the MSM to two. Um, it confirms what we're seeing in clinical practice, which is that the three step not that great for patients who have frequent hypoglycemic episodes. Um, Carol and I discussed a patient who had a freestyle put on for hypoglycemic evaluation and was constantly in a hypoglycemic rate for four years on a freestyle but never on a freestyle. Um, so this is what we're seeing. This is consistent with what we're seeing in clinical practice and should guide our decisions as we recommend new devices. What were the people that you did this on? What were the response? Were they willing to do it? So the, the, so the, some of them, yes. Um, the, the challenge with our, our clinical trial is that they were all funded. So they actually weren't making any data, so they really just were wearing this thing and underwent sort of procedure for no event. And there were 90 patients who did this study just for no data, you know, but just out of the goodness of their heart, they knew that this was the product. Should, 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 should. Yes. 